So hello, thank you for joining us today. Welcome. Uh, my name is Nicholas Rouleau. I'm counsel for Fair Change. Uh, we have copies of our documents on the table over there. Please uh, don't hesitate to grab some, as well as a press conference speaker schedule. Um, we have a packed agenda this morning. Uh, I'll start off by calling up uh, four uh, members of Fair Change who will each give uh, statements. We'll take questions from the media uh, for those four individuals afterwards. Um, following uh, these questions, I'll call up one by one organizations that are supporting Fair Change, and we'll deal with questions from the media one by one after each of those organizations. Uh, we'll take additional questions at the end if there are some remaining. Uh, so let me call up first Joanna Neffs, the Executive Director of Fair, Fair Change. Good morning. Uh, I've been the director, uh, Executive Director of Fair Change for the past nine years. I founded it. Uh, and in that past nine years, I've learned that the Safe Streets Act is wasteful, it is discriminatory, and it is harmful. Let me explain. Approximately 1% of all the tickets that are given out in Ontario are Safe Streets Act tickets. This means that $2 million per year is spent on court time processing Safe Streets Act tickets. That adds that doesn't include the amount of time that we spend uh, for police officers to spend giving out the tickets or the hours that administrative staff spend uh, processing the tickets or trying to collect the money. The cost <clears throat> or the cost of jailing people huh, or the cost of jailing people who are incarcerated for panhandling. Fines that are imposed by, for panhandling are almost never collected, but taxpayers are still paying for the courtroom, the justice of the peace, the police officers, the prosecutors, and the administrative staff to process the tickets. The Safe Streets Act is wasteful. Second, the Safe Streets Act is discriminatory. People who have mental and intellectual disabilities are hit hardest by the Safe Streets Act. They are most likely to get tickets, and they have the most difficult time fighting their tickets. The system puts the responsibility on the person with the disability to establish their disability in front of the court. For some people with severe mental and intellectual disabilities, this is literally impossible. So the SSA has a disproportionate effect on persons with disabilities. There are other ways that the SSA is discriminatory, particularly in terms of racial discrimination. However, I'm going to let the representative from Aboriginal Legal Services discuss the discriminatory racial considerations. The SSA is harmful. Convictions for panhandling add up. Many people who are on the streets have thousands, if not tens of thousands of dollars of tickets. These affect your ability to get a driver's license and they affect your credit score. The SSA makes it harder for people who are homeless to find jobs and housing. The SSA makes it harder for people to escape homelessness. When jail is imposed for panhandling, people who have housing might lose their housing and be forced back onto the street. In this way, the SSA actually increases homelessness. The SSA is the worst kind of law. It hurts only the most vulnerable and it increases homelessness, the exact opposite of what it is supposed to do. When this happens in Canada, we have a remedy. We challenge the law. We repeal it or we ask the court to strike it down. That's what Fair Change is doing. Yesterday, we filed a challenge to the Safe Streets Act asking the court to strike down this horrible law. In addition, there is a bill before the Ontario legislature right now and we ask that the Ontario government pass this bill and repeal the Safe Streets Act. Canadians are better than this. We don't believe in kicking people when they're down, and we don't believe in hurting people who can't stand up for themselves. The SSA is a law that attacks only the most vulnerable, and it is wasteful and it is wrong. Thank you. I'll call up Peter Rosenthal, next speaker, Council for Fair Change. Thanks, good morning. I'm very happy to be representing Fair Change along with Nicholas Rouleau in this constitutional challenge. You're down and out, imagine it, you're, you're down and out, you're walking down the street looking needy. You pass a bus stop 
and there's a guy waiting at the bus stop who gives you a friendly look. So you say to that person, sir, could I have a little money for a cup of coffee? And the person says, sure, and gives you a toonie. And you say thank you, and you walk down the street a little bit, and then a police officer has been observing this, and he charges you for violating the Safe Streets Act. And you're guilty. There's no possible defense. You have violated the Safe Streets Act. That's absurd, isn't it? And thousands of panhandlers have suffered from that absurdity. Not only is it obviously absurd, it's also, in our view, illegal given the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. Of course, there could be panhandling that really is aggressive and dangerous and should be prohibited, but that's prohibited by the criminal law, such as extortion and so on. Extortion and assault would apply in any case where a panhandler was really aggressively trying to get change from a passerby. But the Safe Streets Act criminalizes very innocuous panhandling, the kind of panhandling that's been going on in cities for years. Now, you would think 20 years after its inception almost, the new government that's been in effect since those years would have quashed it, but they haven't. We still hope they will in light of all the opposition to it, but we are launching this challenge in case they don't. In our view, the Safe Streets Act violates a number of sections of the Charter. It obviously violates freedom of expression, and it can't be justified, in our view, given the deleterious effects of the Act since then. One thing that's different from the beginning of this Act is that we now have the experience that Fair Change and others can report on of the devastating effects of this Act on the homeless people and other poor people who are forced to panhandle. It violates freedom of expression, it violates equality rights, it violates the right to life, liberty, and security of the person. We've launched a challenge, and you can have the details in the document that's available to you. The next step that we have to do is prepare evidence over the summer that will support the allegations in our notice, and we intend to do that. And we hope that we can bring this matter to a hearing before next summer, before the summer of 2018. On the other hand, we hope more than that. We hope that the government will realize, given the application and given the kind of support for repealing the act that you'll see in the following speakers, that they should repeal the act rather than going through defending it. So that's our hope, and we're glad to speak to the Attorney General or his designate at any time about that possibility. Thanks very much. Uh, thank you, Peter. Our next speaker is Daniel Cherubellini, the Managing Director of Fair Change. Good morning. The very name of this legislation, the Safe Streets Act, invites a question. Safe for whom? Because the truth is, the Safe Streets Act causes a tremendous amount of harm. It hurts some of the most vulnerable and voiceless people in Ontario. I know this to be the case. I've seen it with my own eyes over the past several years. The Safe Streets Act effectively makes it illegal for individuals to ask for help in many public spaces, and particularly in the public spaces where help is most likely to be received. It labels many people as aggressive when they are not being aggressive. It punishes people who have not done anything wrong. Trials are conducted without the accused present. There is no oversight and there is no accountability. No one can tell you how many innocent people have been convicted. Let me be clear. Ontario does not have a handling problem. Ontario has a poverty problem. It has a mental health problem. And we still have a long way to go in righting the wrongs done to Indigenous people as you'll hear more about. The Government of Ontario leaves many people with no real choice but to ask for help. The Safe Streets Act is not just an act of provincial parliament. It is an act of cruelty. And it is the worst kind of cruelty because it is unnecessary. It is unnecessary because the punishments it imposes, fines and imprisonment, do not and cannot deter people from panhandling. Because the alternatives, for example, going without basic necessities, 
will always be worse. The tickets are almost never paid because they can't be paid. And when a person is imprisoned, they emerge even worse off than they were before. The Safe Streets Act costs Ontarians millions of dollars per year in administration and enforcement. Millions of dollars which is never recovered, all for the purposes of making our streets safe. And so again I ask, safe for whom? Thank you. Uh, our next statement will be by Jerry Williams, a former client of Fair Change. Following Jerry's statement, uh, the uh, individuals with Fair Change will take questions from the media. Morning. Uh, my name is Jerry Williams. I was convicted of several hundred provincial offenses, uh, totaling $65,000 of which close to $10,000 were safe street tickets for panhandling. The truth is I've had a very difficult life. I grew up in a First Nation community on the shores of James Bay. It is a fly-in reserve in economic and social conditions. When I was growing up, were up missile. My home and community life were up, were, was very traumatic. Several generations of my family were forced into a residential school system. I was not equipped for city life when I left the reserve. I, I received nearly all of my tickets between 2005 to 2014 when I was trapped in a nine-year cycle of homelessness, alcoholism, and untreated post-traumatic stress. I, I am a very different person today than I was when I was living on the streets or even before the streets. I uh, made a decision to get honest with myself and to, uh, to leave the past behind. Uh, I've been sober three years now, and with the help of Fur Change Community Clinic, I, I appealed uh, the fines that I had, $65,000, when I was living on the streets. And I was given um, some community service in exchange for the... I don't know, I w I don't know what I would have done if, if not for Fur Change winning my case. I could never pay $65,000 in fines or 10000 or even $100, and, and I was dependent on ODSP. I lived pay paycheck to paycheck, owing an unpayable debt caused, caused me to feel very anxious, and it made it even more difficult for me to maintain my sobriety and keep my PDST in check. My tickets prevented me from obtaining a driver's license and would have made it much more difficult for me to obtain quality housing, credit, or even a good job eventually. I am grateful for Fur Change for helping me. The law isn't fair, it's wrong, and it should be repealed. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jerry. If I could ask the Fair Change members to come up here, uh, we'll take uh, any questions from the media. Hi, Mr. Rosenthal. I'm Hi. Matthew from The Star. How are you doing? I'm okay, how are you? I'm good. I just wanted some clarification. So when it comes to extreme aggression on the streets, you're saying that the only people that should be penalized when panhandling is people that demonstrate something that comes close to assault or criminal activity. Is that right? Yes. The only reasonable definition of aggressive panhandling, in my view, if you're talking about panhandling that should be punished, it would come into, it would be extortion, for example. If you threaten somebody in order to get money from them, that's extortion. So you don't need uh, a Safe Streets Act for that. But the Safe Streets Act applies to all sorts of other situations that are totally innocuous. Is it fair to say for all of those other situations, you don't think there should be any monitoring or penalty of any kind? People should just be allowed to, to request money on the streets? As they have been for generations, unfortunately. We've had panhandlers ever since cities have existed, and it's a fact of life. There are people impoverished who need to panhandle. And why do we have to harass them with the Safe Streets Act and make their lives even worse? In addition, if the money's spent attacking street people were instead spent on providing for them, it'd be much less panhandling. Thank you. Just if I could get some background. Are we talking about the law that uh, the Harris government has uh, adopted? Do we yes. go as far as that? 
Yes. In 1999, the Harris government, as part of what some people characterized as the war on the poor, cut welfare benefits and introduced the Safe Streets Act. And it's been repressing homeless people ever since. Sorry? The liberals have never killed it? They have never killed it, and we hope they kill it tomorrow. Bill apparently right now. Could you explain more the difference between the bill and the existing law? There is a difference between the bill and the Harris Times and the Liberals' modification of it that strengthens our argument in our view. Namely, the Liberals passed an amendment that exempts registered charities from provisions of the Safe Streets Act. So somebody who's a member of a registered charity requesting f funds on behalf of the home of homeless people, for example, and the charity may be taking a cut of it, they're allowed to do it, but a homeless person, him or herself, can't do it. So in our view, that strengthens our argument about how discriminatory this act is. But the liberals, unfortunately, have chosen to keep it in place. We hope they make a different choice tomorrow. Peter, you've been involved in um, the challenge to the Safe Streets, Act, Safe Streets Act before. What's changed since then? Why do you think this now is a good time why is it right for, for a new challenge? A good question. Why should the challenge succeed today when it failed 15 years ago? And p part of the answer, a big part of the answer, is the experience since then. Fair Change has told you some about the experience since then of the act. And when you look at that and you compare the benefits, which are non non-existent in my view, to the harms of it, Looking over 15 years, it's clear which way it should go. It can't, the violations of the act, of the charter, cannot be justified because the deleterious effects are so terrible. Do we have a timeline? Like uh, you said, that now it has been presented to the courts. <clears throat> We don't know. There's, what has to happen is we have to compile affidavit evidence and support. We hope to do that over the summer. Then the government, if it chooses to defend it, will have the right to provide evidence in opposition to that. And then we have to go to a hearing. We're hoping we can do it all before next summer. Do you have a ballpark for the number of people you hope to, to get affidavits from? How many people do you employ getting? I, I would think... <laughs> I, I, I estimate from preliminary uh, discussions with various experts is I would suggest we'll probably have about between 10 and 15 affiants. Thank you. Uh, we'll be available to answer questions following the uh, the various other uh, individuals. Uh, let me ask uh, for her statement, uh, next statement, uh, Renu Mandane, the Chief Commissioner of the Ontario Human Rights Commission, to come up. Good morning. The Ontario Human Rights Commission is here today because poverty is one of the most pressing human rights issues facing our society. At its heart, the Human Rights Code promotes human dignity, respect, social inclusion, and the ability for everyone to reach their full potential. That's why we welcome the government's goal of reducing poverty and its commitment to ending chronic homelessness within 10 years. At the same time, laws that stigmatize and criminalize people who are homeless, make it harder for them to secure stable housing, employment, or access education, aren't consistent with the government's aspirations or with the Human Rights Code. The Safe Streets Act, unfortunately, is one of these laws. Poverty is a human rights issue because it isn't experienced equally. The government's own expert panel found that homelessness disproportionately linked with race, gender, sexual orientation, age, disability, immigration status, mental health disabilities and addiction, and indigenous identity. These are precisely the groups the Human Rights Code is meant to protect. 
The situation is especially acute for First Nations, Métis, and Inuit people who continue to suffer from the intergenerational trauma caused by residential schools and ongoing colonialism. For example, in Thunder Bay, Indigenous people make up nearly three quarters of the homeless population. These are realities that I have witnessed firsthand in my own tours of Northwestern Ontario. The Safe Streets Act originally targeted so-called squeegee kids who were seen as a nuisance or people to be feared. But homeless youth are some of the most vulnerable people in our society. In a 2015 survey, a large proportion of homeless youth identified as LGBTQ2S, Indigenous or racialized. They are often fleeing child, ab child abuse or neglect. On the streets, they become more vulnerable to exploitation, mental health disabilities, and addictions. The Ontario government has the power to eliminate unnecessary burdens faced by vulnerable people and take a step towards reconciliation by repealing the Safe Streets Act. To that end, we've sent a public letter to Ontario's Attorney General urging the government to take immediate action. As a society, we must shift our focus from criminalization of homeless people to addressing the underlying causes of poverty. That's what a rights-based approach to poverty requires, and that's why the Human Rights Commission is here today. Thank you, and I'm happy to take some questions. Thank you. Our next speakers will be Mary Birdsell and Julia Heise uh, from Justice for Children and Youth. Hi, I'm Mary Birdsell. At, I'm the Executive Director at Justice for Children and Youth, and this is my colleague, Julia Heis. Uh, Justice for Children and Youth is a legal clinic in Ontario that is uh, focused on the rights and interests of children and young people, um, and in particular, children and young people who are living in poverty. We have been concerned about and have been resisting the enactment of the Safe Streets Act since before it began and have continued to uh, be concerned and as Peter mentioned have continued to watch the growing uh, body of evidence to support the concerns that we had from the outset and in addition have continued to watch uh, m small changes to the Safe Streets Act that actually make it worse uh, as opposed to uh, trying to alleviate the negative impact of it. The Safe Streets Act is not directed at, uh, at most of us who are here today. It's not directed at people who are uh, asking for a quarter uh, to, to use the phone, as we used to say in, in the older days when the phone was only 25 cents and you needed it to use a public one. The Safe Streets Act is meant to be directed, as, uh, as Renu said, at squeegee kids, at homeless people, at people who are powerless in many respects, including economic respects, um, and also are often politically powerless. And so what do we do? We take out a sledgehammer. Uh, and bully people, uh, try and move them underground instead of trying to address the concerns that really exist around panhandling, which are not the request for money, are not the seeking of alms, the seeking of assistance from your fellow people, but they are the uh, uh, negative, horrible effects of being homeless and, uh, and, and living in extreme poverty. Um, you know, we've had several people already speak eloquently about the kinds of ways in which uh, extreme poverty and homelessness can affect you in many, many other contexts. Um, I think it's not an exaggeration to say that everybody who works on the front lines with people who are ticketed by the Safe Streets Act sees only negative impacts. There has never been a positive impact on a person who is ticketed by those tickets. Homelessness is a complex social concern, and we need to address it and, and meet the, uh, the tragedy of this reality in nuanced and, uh, and kind and supportive ways. So while this is a, a social concern that is nuanced and complex, the solutions to homelessness are much easier than you might think. They are not things like the Safe Streets Act that seek to criminalize and harm people. They are simple things like a, co a comprehensive housing strategy and, uh, and many of the other things that we have long understood to be relevant to the ending of poverty. 
Ticketing people who panhandle is not a useful response. It takes a jackhammer to a needlepoint problem. Thank you. Uh, I am the Street Youth Legal Services lawyer at Justice for Children and Youth. Every day I work with homeless youth in the City of Toronto and I have seen through my work that the Safe Streets Act does nothing to move young people out of extreme poverty. In fact, it only works to make things worse. Research shows that when you limit or prohibit safe, albeit alternative or temporary ways of accessing money, people may have no alternative but to turn to dangerous or exploitive methods such as sex work or the drug trade in order to support themselves. Young people who are homeless and experience extreme poverty rely on the money earned from panhandling to support themselves and to stay out of these other dangerous methods of, of income earning. The debt that they can accrue from Safe Streets Act tickets hinders their ability to make basic steps to exit this extreme poverty. I have seen this through my work. It is not possible for young people to pay these debts and as a result they are prevented from renting an apartment, from getting a driver's license or obtaining a student loan. The debts, in effect, keep young people in poverty. They are denied the opportunities that so many other young people in our society are afforded, um, and they do not benefit from them. The Safe Streets Act pushes our community's most vulnerable members, including homeless youth, further to the margins, and it does nothing to, make po to reduce poverty. It only makes it less visible. Thank you. We wanted to point out um, one of the things that I have found to be uh, infuriating and frustrating in recent years. Uh, Peter mentioned that there has been an amendment that allows charities to, uh, to panhandle uh, or to seek, uh, to seek or to make requests for assistance on the streets. And I think that any of you who have been in the subway will have seen that literally homeless youth serving organizations and other poverty uh, helping organizations are panhandling with tin cans in the subway, shaking the cans and calling out, please make a donation to help such and such a charity. And that act would be illegal for the young people who themselves are actually living in that condition. This kind of hypocrisy cannot be something that we uh, live with in a democratic and fair society. Thank you. Uh, next, we have Jessica Wolf, Senior Staff Lawyer with Aboriginal Legal Services. Ani, hello, my name is Jessica Wolf. I'm Anishinaabe from Brunswick House First Nation. Uh, that means I'm not from uh, this territory, and I'm grateful uh, to the traditional uh, residents of this territory to allow me to live and work here. Uh, indigenous people in Canada and in Ontario are more likely to experience poverty and homelessness as a consequence of the history of colonialism, displacement, residential school and child welfare systems, and inadequate housing both on and off reserves. In fact, in Toronto, 16% of the people experiencing homelessness identify as Indigenous. Uh, the numbers are even worse, as you heard, in some other cities like Thunder Bay. In Toronto, this is uh, almost one in five persons experiencing homelessness, despite being approximately 2% of the city's population. As you've heard, uh, the State Street Safe Streets Act allows the state to fine and jail Indigenous people at disproportionate numbers because they are poor. It has a devastating impact on Indigenous community members and on their families. By criminalizing the Safe Streets Act, Poverty, the Safe Streets Act, is criminalizing Indigenous people. The Safe Streets Act perpetuates negative stereotypes and stigma about our communities, which marginalize Indigenous people even further. It subjects us to increased and often negative interactions with police and the justice system. It creates barriers for Indigenous people trying to get off the streets and perpetuates our conditions of poverty and marginalization. Indigenous youth, women, and trans people are forced to live as a result in marginalized spaces, which make them even more vulnerable to violence. It is our position that the Safe Streets Act doesn't promote public safety. There are tools, as Peter indicated, already in place for dealing with real issues of public safety. The Safe Streets Act 
in our position is an ineffective and inhumane response to homelessness and is contrary to Ontario's commitment to reconciliation with its Indigenous people. Thank you. And finally, we have Jackie Esmond, staff lawyer with the Income Security and Advocacy Centre. Good morning. The Income Security Advocacy Centre is a legal aid clinic, a specialized one that focuses on advocacy aimed at fighting poverty through improving government benefits like social assistance. One of the reasons that people are asking for spare change is the utter inadequacy of social assistance, a program that is supposed to help people with barriers to work who have nowhere else to turn. Instead, it provides an amount that is almost impossible to live on, only $330 per month if you are homeless. The money to meet the most basic needs of life has to come from somewhere, and for some, that means asking for help from strangers. I am here today to express our clinic's support for the legal challenge to the Safe Streets Act. We intend to apply to intervene to ensure that the perspectives of social assistance recipients are heard. No one wants to bring a court case to defend the rights of poor people to ask for spare change. I join with my colleagues in calling on Ontario to repeal the Safe Streets Act and make this court case unnecessary. And if this government truly wants poor people off of the streets, the solutions lie with ending poverty, not with cruel laws like the Safe Streets Act, which criminalizes acts of survival that are driven by the deep inadequacy of social assistance in this province. Thank you very much. And just before we take any other residual questions, let me read a statement from Dean Lorne Sawson of Osgoode Law School, uh, who couldn't join us today. Uh, Charter challenges like the one being brought against the Safe Streets Act will not by itself change Canadian society or solve the many problems which bring vulnerable people to the streets, but this challenge does represent a concrete and important step forward. While I believe this Charter challenge has much merit, I remain hopeful it will not be, be necessary to litigate this claim. Rather, I join with the many others who have urged the Ontario Legislature to replace the Safe Streets Act with initiatives that will enhance community, health and social supports for those in need. The Ontario government has done much to improve the lives of vulnerable people. Days like today remind us that much work lies ahead to make our society truly fair and just. The Safe Streets Act was an ill-conceived attempt to criminalize the poor and marginalized, and it has been left on the books for too long. The Act accepts and reproduces stereotypes about those who panhandle as dangerous and deviant. There was little evidence at the time it was enacted that it would contribute to making streets safer, and there has been little evidence since that time that it has in fact done so. Like earlier criminal sanctions against vagrancy and loitering, the Safe Streets Act reflects outmoded thinking that is out of step with today's Canada. The fact that the law disproportionately affects young people, people living with mental health issues, and Indigenous people makes its impact even more problematic. As Dean of Osgoode Hall Law School, I am especially proud of the law students who have volunteered with the Fair Change Clinic to bring the impact of the Safe Streets Act to the attention of the whole country and beyond. And this is Lauren Sawson, Dean of Osgoode Hall uh, Law School at York University. Uh, so thank you, and uh, we will take any other questions uh, or be available for interviews afterwards. Thank you.